the timer running at the top. Excellent. Good. Let's start then. So, to, um, to break the ice and make you feel all relaxed, would you like to tell us what happened last year, Brad? I was too long. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was uh, goaded into going to the wrong session by Karen. And he's setting up. Indeed. I asked for some help to put some tables out. So we did this, and Matt duly helped. An hour into my session. No, 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 no. It's, <laughs> it's slightly near the beginning of that. Uh, we came to the conclusion that Matt was not the only person, but there were, I thought the group was rather large, but there were several people who shouldn't be in the room. <coughs> so, this is the module about pastoral care, okay? Introduction to um, methods of reading the Bible is next door. Uh, I think Phil's doing something on ethics or doctrine next door. But if you're doing pastoral care, then you're in the right room. Is that okay? Do you know you're doing pastoral care? Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Uh, in which case, can we do some introductions first? Is there a, I am neither famous nor infamous, but everybody knows who I am, don't you now? <laughs> Is there a question you've ever been dying to ask about me? By way of openness and encouragement. Is this the only book? That's not a problem. You made it. Oh, I see. I thought I thought talking to the Kelly book. Oh, okay. okay. This, this, you've edited this book. I have. Yes. Right. Did you write it, or was it like something else that you been through? Or how, did it, how did it come about? Come about? Uh, I've written about sixty-five percent of it. Right. If you read the introduction, it tells you every single chapter has somebody's name by it. Right. So I think I think six chapters have got my. It's a collaborative process, so even though I did the, the majority of the work, yeah. it, I, I also edited the other bits that I didn't think of. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Is that a first one? Or is there any first one? and last. <laughs> 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 that yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely an interesting experience. Yeah. Anybody else? <clears throat> did money change hands to get it into the key reading? <laughs> Sadly, no. <laughs> neither, neither way. Neither way. Um, Chris, would you like to introduce yourself? Um, Christopher Halliday. I'm the retired uh, team rector from Saddleworth. I retired three years ago. And I was just saying, I think I'm right. 38 years ago, I would have been sat in a room like this on the former, but former, but former Northern Automation course. So I sympathise with you. It brought back memories of sitting here feeling dog tired after a day's work and having to come to this, whatever this was. You know, every in my case it was every Monday night. In uh, first of all in the old Oxford Road department of the Polytechnic, and then it was at Luke Health. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things that will emerge during the evening, I think, is that this this module has at least five at least five or six students. Partly because, as we discover later, the majority of the work is actually done in small groups, which means we need a lot of people. So, but Chris was very kind to come along tonight, and some of the other two students may be able to come along in four weeks' time at our next meeting. Part of the process of actually us getting to know you as a teaching group as well. Um, some of you, uh, some of you have been doing different things anyway until now. Uh, some of you have been in the same course. Some of you meet each other in the same class all the time. But some of you are on different pathways, and it can be a bit. Um, needless to say, in this module, whether you're doing the All Saints version, or whether you're doing the uh, Durham version, or even if you're in inverted commas auditing it, then certainly everything that happens at summer school is the same for everybody. If you are auditing it, just have a word with me later on just to check what it is I think you are doing in inverted commas. But basically, we're all in the same boat as it were. Okay. Um, I'm hoping that um, tonight, <coughs> despite some of perhaps a bit trepidations about what's going to happen, so it's all Hello, you all right? Excellent. It's okay, we're running out of chairs now. Can you, um, can you go up next to Angie over there? Okay, we, need, we, might need, we, might need, we might need to give you a chair. Can you try it back? I left a nice narrow gap for you to get through. Um, I have one simple aim for this evening, and, 
and you might you might think this is really simplistic and pragmatic, but my simple aim for this evening is to make sure that when you leave tonight, you know how this module works, because there's no other module like it at All Saints in British College in the way in which it is both delivered and assessed. Okay, so you might think, have we come all this way just to find out how the module works? Well, this is my promise. Once I feel that all of you in the room understand how this module works, or half past nine, whichever one comes first will go home. Is that okay? Now I hope that doesn't discourage you from asking questions. But I, in my own mind, because it's not very easy to do uh, refreshment breaks in this building, uh, Angie's very kind of brought some stuff along. There's more um, in my bag. And you've got more in your bag. So we will have a break, but we'll try and keep the break short, because in my own mind I'm actually heading for nine o'clock. But the timetable to 9.30 in case we need it, so we'll just, we'll just see how it goes. Um, <clears throat> each year we do this, I did send out the reading list uh, about a week ago because people were asking for it, but I always assume for this module that nobody has done anything before tonight. The reason for that is because you're all doing different things until now, and the end of the academic year when you run into May gets quite busy, even for people in their first, even in their people at penultimate year of training, it's even worse than the final year, unfortunately. So there's been quite a lot of assignments stacking up. So have you got anybody got any other assignments due in now before summer school? Are you are you clear? You have? Just next week, okay. Anybody else? Okay, so basically you're kind of, you're kind of clear, clear of assignments now. Okay. So what I want to do is to try and unpack how this module works and the bits of paper that you've got are simply extracts of the very fresh Moodle pages that went up this afternoon. Okay. The reason for that is because I've forgotten to transfer them from the old one. Um, you might have to share actually, because they're, if, if you have one of those, what you need is one of those. Um, so you might, you might have to look at it. The pages are on Moodle anyway, so <coughs> you, can, you can get the information as soon as you go home. So, this is a module about pastoral care. And some of you will may have even have some experiences of pastoral care in the past. You may have been on a counselling course, you may have been on a listening course, some of you have been on a, a readers' course, or perhaps in the Diocese of Manchester you've been on a, um, what are ALMs called now? Um, what's the full title of ALM in Manchester? I've got, what, what's, the, what's that new thing in Manchester where you, the, before you become a reader? I thought they're called, they're called ALMs, Associate Local Ministers. Authorised Local Ministers. Authorised Local Ministers. And some of those are in pastoral care, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so some of you may have done bits of pastoral care before. Um, it's reasonable to say, I think, that when we, when we went to Durham, because we were compelled to, like all the training institutions in the country, one of our big fears was, because of Durham's justifiable and good reputation, was that if we're not careful, we'd get driven down really strongly down a kind of a assignment, written assignment route. And I'm hoping that what we've done with this module, this is the third time we've run it now under Durham regulation, tries as far as we, as we can to get away from that idea that it's all about actually writing assignments. Okay. So the first book that's on the reading list, the uh, Ewan Kelly one, the one that you've got to do the book review on, which is this one here. I'm still hot from running around when I discovered I have no power points at the back of the room. Sorry about this. The Ewan Kelly, the person person book. On this first piece of paper, I've got some quotes for you, which basically sum up our approach to this module. Okay? The way in which All Saints approaches learning together about pastoral care is aptly summed up in the introduction to Ewan Kelly's book. Here are some of the things he says. The purpose of this book is to offer an aid to those who seek to understand their individual personal better, with a view to enhancing the quality of pastoral relationships that they are in and will enter into. And it's about purposeful reflection of practice, thus deepening self-awareness. And he claims, and I would agree, that it is a moral imperative for those entrusted with the care of souls. <coughs> and these dimensions of our personhood are primarily exposed through a theological lens, because we are Christians, as this is what makes the role of spiritual or pastoral carer who is rooted in the Christian tradition, distinctive. So that also means that makes it distinctive in terms of the pastoral care as a Christian, whether you're a lay person, or a licensed person, or a deacon, or a priest, 
your understanding of pastoral care is different, and in fact, Kelly would say, and I would say, distinctive from a wider understanding of pastoral care because it's rooted in our membership <coughs> as sisters and brothers in the body of Christ, so we have a different perspective on what pastoral care means. So let me put it another way. If I, <coughs> when I get to, perhaps I should tell you this at one level, when I get to this part of the year now, I'm writing reports on students. We've got pages and pages of recommendations from the Minister of Vision about all these are the things that you are supposed to do. And we get, to, you all know this, we get, we get you to write reports, we get your supervising ministers to write report, reports on you. And then most of us try and distill that into about two pages so that can kind of go off to the bishop. And we do that really carefully and it takes a long time. But somewhere along the route, what usually happens, because we're all human beings, is you kind of say to yourself, well, here's, here's Sarah. Say I'm, something happens to me one Sunday and at fairly short notice I can't take the services in whichever church I have to be placed at the moment. And I know for a fact that Sarah is free on Sunday, would I send her? Do you see what I mean? At the, at the end of the day, I suspect this happens in a lot of professions. Basically, our assessment of actually where we think people are is basically whether or not we think that they can do our job in those places. So, when it comes to pastoral care, what I'm interested in, if I've got anybody in my big parish or any community I'm a member of, what I'm interested in terms of pastoral care is not can this person write a really nice essay for Durham, but does this person know their self well enough to begin to grow into what it means to be give and receive pastoral care in this community? To me. And for me, that is a fundamental difference. So I think that's precisely why we've chosen the You and Kelly book, because I think that's precisely the approach that he takes, that first quotation there, with a view to enhancing the quality of the pastoral relations as they are and will enter into. Okay? So in other words, a bit like the preaching module, I'm more interested in whether people can preach sermons than whether they can write essays about sermons, and I'm more interested in whether people can give pastoral care to each other and know themselves well enough to give pastoral care than to be able to write assignments about it. So, as a basic premise, that might seem really, really obvious, but what do you think? Yeah. What do you think? Tell me what's exciting and then I'll tell you what's scary about it. And that's just for the tutors. <laughs> what do you think? So it seems to me that you use skills fund, thanks, I like that. In the sense we're, we're, we're dealing at least on three levels here, aren't we? We're talking about knowing oneself, acquiring the skills, understanding other people. You know what I mean? And you know, just in other words, we're all everybody every single person in this room is capable of reading books and otherwise we wouldn't be on this type of course. And every single one of us is if they're, if they're capable of acquiring different skills in different places. And if we were to if we were to spot on a series of skills in particular things. Some of you would just sigh and say, well, I've, I've not done that, Gary. And some of you will say, well, actually, I can't do that one because I haven't done this skill yet. So skills can also be applied. But in terms of our formation as well, as licensed ministers and deacons and priests at all saints, then it strikes me that one of the key things we're doing as we go along is trying to think about who we are and where we are. And the danger is, is that because of work and because of family and because of all the teaching and the knowledge base that you, we, we all feel we should have for ministry anyway, the danger is if you're not careful, that goes out the window. And yet the irony is when it comes to report writing and when it comes to recommendations for bishops for ordination, you're not interested about what their results are. You're interested in will this person be an effective minister of the gospel? Does this person know himself? Somebody else? What do we else think about as a basic principle?
absolutely. And it, it is still the case, I think, that sadly, though I think, though I, though I know it's hardly ever been my experience, and I don't think it's been Christopher's experience much, I think he might say something about it in a moment. Um, it, is, it is still sad to say, even in this 21st century, we still get some clergy who work alone. That, that is, quite frankly, their style of ministry. It doesn't matter how big the parish is. They, they tend to work alone. And even, and even sometimes if it looks like they've got lots of people around them, what it actually is, is a kind of sophisticated kind of delegation, whereby actually they're still working on their own. And yet, theologically, ministry has to be collaborative, not desirable, but actually theologically. So, you know, so when, I, when I was a curate in Oldham, for example, I was part of the Oldham team. When I did my second curacy, there was myself, the vicar, and two pastoral assistants. Now, when I went to my first incumbency in North Manchester, there were five parishes in, in, in the group. And obviously when I went to um, Birmingham and worked in the cathedral, I was in a, in a chapter. And then when I come here now in this job, I'm a member of a, of a group of about a dozen or 15 officers in the diocese and, and a group of about you know six or 10 core people at the Centre of All Saints here. I, I've actually, in a, in a weird kind of way, don't know what it's like to work on my own. And even when I was in, you know, even, if, and even, even within the five groups in North Manchester, within the parish, there was myself and a reader and some other people that were training up in those jobs. What? been your experience? <coughs> um, similar, except I've been mostly in rural parish here, where you actually feel isolated unless you have got people, you draw people around you yeah. from, from you know, the community that you work in, yeah. because you, your clergy colleagues could be 20 miles away. Yeah. yeah. So, that's, so that's page two. <coughs> let's, 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 um, let's flip the page. Your, if you look at your timetable, I, I, haven't, I haven't got one in front of me, but it's not a problem because I know this timetable reasonably well. <laughs> if you look at the timetable, you'll notice that there are five reflection groups. Okay? There's one on Saturday morning, one on Sunday afternoon, one on Monday morning, Tuesday morning, and Wednesday morning. And you'll notice that they're scheduled for two hours. You'll also notice that after that there's a coffee break for half an hour, then there's a schedule for an hour of unpacking. And apart from the fact that on a Sunday, it happens in Sunday afternoon because of visits to parishes on Sunday morning. Basically, the pattern is the same every day. And if we just leave Sunday aside as the exception, from your point of view for this module, you're doing all the, what I call the heavy lifting in the mornings. And in the afternoon, you've either got, you've either got a bit of free time and possibly um, home groups or some other activity in the evening. But basically, your, your, the work that you're doing for this module all takes place in the mornings. So given the things I've said about knowing yourself, and given the things I said about collaborative working, one, one of the things we try to imagine on the summer <coughs> and practice our intentional participation in, one of the things we try to imagine is what I call a an effective and healthy ministry team. So I'm thinking of a ministry team in either a parish or a group of parishes, and it's got at least three or four people. If, even if it's only one parish, it might have the, the, the vicar and the reader and the pastoral minister and either the musician or the, or the church warden or somebody else, but that parish has deliberately formed a ministry team. So hands up if in the parish you either are worshipping at the moment or your home parish, they have some form of named ministry team. Okay. So hands up, if, hands up if you don't. Okay. And that's very honest of you, helpful. Why is that, do you think? Is it kind of, is it just the way it is, or dare you say, or? <laughs> you used to have an FM station yeah. um, when we had an ONL. Yeah. Um, which is actually a lot smaller. You're a very small parish, aren't you? Yeah. yeah. And so whilst certainly I and my companion Tom are able to do what we train in regularly, yeah. we don't formally have a ministry team. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. But you do meet regularly. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Anybody else who doesn't have one covertly? But I think the dynamics of the new benefit is right. it's not uh, wanting to work towards it, but we, so we have uh, a ministry team, we have Alan, and then we have yep. uh, Deirdre, and we have an OLM. Yep. And they all have very specific roles, and they all filter, and I think this is where it came from, they all filter very comfortably in specific roles, right? And never push themselves outside of those comfort zones. So they do 
if they've gone and left their name. Anything else? You don't have to say it might be confidential. Yeah, it is, it is um, there, are, there is art that are incumbent, and then there are two um, particular groups that, as well. Um, one actually works full time, and then the other one does like a certain job. Um, we do have a reader, um, but they're often visually very limited, and they will only take the book and the book will ask for service. Um, so it, it sort of it's informal, it's yeah. informal discussion. There wouldn't be normally formal meetings that we go to, um, but this is actually something that happens in small ways, you know, or just passing the email by the evening or whatever. Um, I mean, I, th I mean, I think there has been, a, I think there has been a sea change in the church community. I think if you were to go back th 25 or 35 years ago and ask a room full of people the same question, I think there'd be fewer hands going up in the air. Yeah, because the Church of England has come very strongly out of a culture. Of literally, you know, I mean, in the old days, it was the, the vicar was literally the jack of all trades, you know what I mean? And, and that, that is the model that perpetuates a lot of places. It's interesting that where I am at the moment, for example, in the village I live, and this, this isn't talking out of turn because I'm sharing facts with you rather than interpreting them. I find it interesting because I've lived there for 12 years now that um, neither of the first two incumbents who have been there while I've been there, you know, it didn't occur to either of them to form a ministry team. And I think that's something to do with the culture in which they were trained. So it just never occurred to me. And we have a ministry team now in my village, a small parish of only 50 people. But we do have a ministry team of four people. We've, only, we've not yet been meeting a year. You see what I mean? So if I was doing this last year, when I asked that question, who, who, who's not in the ministry team, my hand had to go up last year. Yeah. Because I think there is, there is, there is a sea change in the way in, way in which people are trying to do things. One of the ironies, and that is probably not helped by about 35 years ago in some diocese the Church of England suddenly deciding that groups and teams were the answer to everything <laughs> and some people got put into groups and teams and then inevitably there was a backlash because most groups or teams don't work very well where people are compelled to come together but when people choose to come together that's a very different matter we've got no GPs here have we? no? no, no. I do find it interesting and it'd be wonderful if someone did some research on this or even just writing about it. I do find it interesting that I reckon until about, or perhaps even so now, but certainly until 25 or 30 years ago, I think the closest role model in terms of how their ministry works for an incumbent in Anglican parish was actually the GP who lived in the parish. So I mean, so, I mean once upon a time, that, I mean, if you go far, back far enough, there might have been the school teacher who lived in the village and there might be the GP and there might be the clergy person. But certainly 25, 30 years ago, certainly when I went to my parish in North Man Manchester, for example, the GP of the practice lived in the parish. Yeah. And again, that has changed now. But what I do find interesting, therefore, is that whereas in the Church of England, teams and groups were kind of imposed by the centre because we thought that was a good thing to do, GPs are phenomenally independent. They're as independent as incumbents. Do you know what I mean? Nobody's in charge of them in verticals. What I find interesting in this country, for a whole variety of complex reasons, what I find there must be some other creative reasons, most GPs choose to work in groups now. Do you know what I mean? They, they've not been compelled to work in groups. But I mean, have any of you a member of a GP practice that's only got one GP? Fascinating, isn't it? And yet that's certainly the case when I was a child. Okay? So, what we want to imagine is that you're, and therefore you, you can, if you're not an image team, you just imagine, it's not a problem. Because we're all going to imagine. What we're imagining is, is a, a parish that has what I call a healthy ministry team of four, five, or six people who meet on a regular basis. And when they meet on a regular basis, they're bound to do the obvious things like, you know, doing the preaching rota, sorting out the Lent course, um, thinking about things that are coming up from the PCC, thinking about new initiatives for mission evangelism, all those kind of things, because that's the stuff of a, of a ministry team meeting. And yet, <coughs> even with the most creative ministry team meeting, it's very quickly to fall into the habit of ministry team meetings being business-led. It's all about stuff that we have to do. And one of the things that makes me smile is in the 21st century, a lot of people actually talk about doing ministry as if it's something that you know, you've really kind of be, you, you've got to do, as opposed to being ministers, but that's a conversation for another day, perhaps. So you're in, this, you're in this ministry team, and you have regular meetings, say, once every four weeks or something. But perhaps every other meeting, or every six or nine weeks, you come together without an agenda, and you'll meet, you meet for two hours, and to that meeting, somebody in the ministry team brings something that they want to talk about, okay? 
And this could range from something as simple as, you know, I want to ponder, you know, the fact that we've got a number of young people in their teens drinking cider or young men drinking cider on our doorsteps outside our church. Or it might be, I want to ponder on the fact that, you know, our local school seems to be overcrowded. Or I want to ponder about the way we're actually in trying to engage with young people in our church. Or I want to ponder about the way we're in, engaging with retired and older people in our church. But, but you say you want to ponder it because it's not being defined as a problem. It's, it's being like described as something that is. Yeah? So it's not about problem solving, just something that is. And you bring that to the ministry team meeting. <coughs> And somebody else in the ministry team meeting, perhaps the team leader or the rector or the team vicar the first time it happens, somebody else in that team ministry leads a theological reflection on the issue that you have brought in order to see if you can discern some insight. Yeah. And it may be that at the next meeting, when somebody else brings something, then somebody else in the ministry team facilitates that conversation. And you're you're not deliberately thinking, this is something that we need to solve. You're thinking, this is something we need to explore. Okay? And it may well be, and part of me believes it almost certainly will be, but not, not necessarily overtly, it may well be that in the future, that thinking, of course, informs your business thinking. Yeah? So when you get back to, well, how are we going to reshape the young people's work? then the theological reflection that you have had on the role of young people in your church is then going to influence how you approach what is now becoming something that's on our business agenda. Does that make sense? So what we do at, what we do at, at summer school <coughs> is that because we've got five sessions like that and you'll be in groups of hopefully four, but at the, in a worst case scenario three groups, we're hopefully going to have four groups this year. There'll be seven or eight people in the group and you will work in pairs to facilitate the theological reflection that somebody else in your group brings to that group. Okay? And then you'll you each get a chance to have, to have a go at one of the two people who facilitates, and some of you, but not all of you, will have the opportunity to share whatever is the story or the scenario that you're bringing to the group for the theological reflection. Okay? And we'll unpack what that means, but that, that for me is actually the essence of what happens at summer school. So they can travel to it monthly. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's why we're here tonight. <laughs> Say more about that. What do you mean by that? <laughs> I know, but no, but tell me more about why, why, you, why you... Um, so I suppose um, in my mind, I yeah. have it, you know, sort of thought through it in my head and what yeah. I'm going to do. thinking about the person who brings something, are you? Are you thinking you're thinking you're about the person who brings the story or? Um, no, facilitate, and I think Wait. where I'm coming from, I'm, I have 28 years in HR. Yes. Yeah. So controlling meetings and facilitating controlling meetings. Mm -hmm. and yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm very much controlling them sometimes, facilitating them, yeah, yeah. helping people to kind of bring what they want to talk yeah. about and yeah. things. So all of yeah. that, but ultimately controlling it. Um, so yeah. I'm thinking, you might get a bit nervous here. Yeah. Sorry, whoever I get this. <laughs> and word, and, and, and words, words are really important, aren't they? Because the way you use the word facilitator in HR or in some other discipline can mean different things. And in the, in the straw for the bit, for example, because a lot of the work there comes out of the work of education for ministry in the States and exploring faith matters in England, you can find the, the web links inside the book. Uh, in, in, there we, in there, we always talk about the mentor. So it's the, it's the mentor who enables the group to do the theological reflection. And in here, we sometimes use mentor and sometimes use facilitator because we're trying to make the work accessible to a wider audience. But even to this day, for me, a mentor sums up better what's happening in that group than being a facilitator. Because a facilitator still, for me, has a slightly detached, cold feeling to it, which is only then, as you indicate, one step away from a manipulative and controlling feeling where the mentor is actually someone whose job in, in the education community exploring faith matters is their job to build and manage a learning community. So 
it seems to me by the, the language and the purpose is quite different. So whenever I say in this world, whenever I say facilitator, I'm thinking mentor who builds and manages and services a learning community. It's just easier to say facilitator or mentor. But that's what I mean by facilitator or mentor. So and this is exactly what tonight's for. You to, you to keep asking me interesting questions and we'll keep explaining how it works and we will re reduce your anxieties to almost nothing. <laughs> Go on. So, as facilitators, so presumably we're, all, we're told, are we, to be a good facilitator in this session, in this situation. Yes. Would you know what the situation was that was going to be the subject of your reflection, or do you just do it as if you consciously think, and you do it on the piece of the job? Okay. So, um, on that particular, you're asking the question about whether you know the things coming with you. Two of you are down to, you know, two of you are down to facilitate. Someone's bringing their story, their situation, and do you know anything about it? And there are two ways of working, and it's entirely your choice. You can say, um, "I want to know what the story is," and the person comes and tells it to you. Or you might say, "Can you just give me a hint what kind of story it is?" Or you might say, "I just don't want to know. I just want to work in the moment with what happens in the room." That will depend partly on your personality. If, if, if there's two people working together, you both have to agree. Uh, that help, it is helpful if the two people agree. It is an interesting dynamic, yeah. <laughs> But it's, en it's entirely possible to do it both ways, and if in previous... Do you, can you remember what you did last year? Did they do a mixture of both, or did most people want to know what was happening? Or they, yeah, mostly the, the facilitators asked yeah, yeah. Questions telling the story yeah. beforehand because they wanted to set up things. So. Yeah, yeah. Because it might, and we'll come to this in a minute, it might come to your choice of method of logical reflection as well. And, and some people like to work with that as well. So, other questions? We'll, we'll, we'll turn to assessment for a minute because I know you're dying to get to assessment. <coughs> so, why would tutors who are working with the groups have to be working with them all the time? Okay, very good question. Um, our ideal, because because of the realities of the implementation of the world, our ideal doesn't always get there at first college. Our ideal is that the same the same two tutors, but ideally we work in pairs, stay in the same group all week. Some years we're short on staff. Uh, a couple of times, last couple of years, someone's been ill at the last minute or unavailable, and that happens. Uh, and then on top of that. Because of Durham, um, but not just because of Durham, actually, because no, actually, this is more to do with ourselves, actually. Isn't it? That's, you know, this is to do with ourselves. Yeah, I mean, we, we tell Durham how we do this, but we're quite keen, those of us who are being the tutors, that when we come to the assessment in a minute in terms of what, what kind of how we're grading people in doing this work, we want to make sure that, I mean, you have to use numbers and letters in the end, we want to make sure that B in my group means the same as B in Christopher's group. And so, one of the ways of doing that is we either get another person spends one who visits each of the groups once to kind of help join the dots between the tutors or on one of the on one of the five sessions of the week half the tutors move so that for one of the sessions you end up with a diff you end up with one of your tutors changing but what always happens is one of your tutors never ever leaves the group unless they're ill or something like that. Uh, and, that, that, and then what happens then is that the tutors, the five or six of us, we spend a lot of time outside the group talking to each other about what's going on in the groups, not because we're concerned or interested about you in the covers, <coughs> we're actually concerned and interested about what we're seeing as tutors to make sure that we, we say we're seeing the same thing. Because that's actually about having a level playing field. If this was a written assignment, that would be called moderation or set the mark. Okay. Now, if we were being technical for Durham, Durham would be quite happy for us not to do that when there are two tutors in the group. But we still feel that we want to try and make sure it's the same. Because how can you possibly do that otherwise? Uh, it could just be. And for some, you know, and at the end of the day, for those who are doing the Durham one in particular, but even for the old Saints one as well, at the end of the day, you, you are going to get great for this work and you want to know and feel that you that's been as fair as, as, it's, as it's humanly possible. Given that even marking written assignments is a judgment. Yeah. So you've probably heard this story before, but 
the, the one day that you can work out the difference between a 55 and a 56 will make a lot of money when you write that book. <laughs> you? Yeah, you will sit down and discover that the person next to you got 55 and you got 56. What does that mean? Yeah. So it, 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 it itself is an imprecise, imprecise science or art. Okay. Um, this this module, if you uh, look to the module descriptor, the uh, this module for Durham is assessed by portfolio. Okay. Now the thing about Durham portfolios is is that they're very flexible. Uh, they can be voluminous. You know, you end up putting. 25,000 things in the portfolio. Some people think, seem to think that a port, the quality of a portfolio is measured by how many things it's got in it, as opposed to the quality of the things in it. So what we do, quite simply, is we tell you what's going to go in the portfolio. Okay? Because the Durham portfolio is designed such as that if it was left to the student, <coughs> the student has to fill in a diagram at the beginning showing the marker how each of the activities and each of the elements of their portfolio actually meet the learning outcomes of the module. So what we what we do is we do that for you. So the portfolio then ends up with these elements. The first element of the portfolio is a book review. Okay. The second element of the portfolio is a practical skills exercise on the course reflection. Okay. The third element of the portfolio is a practical skills exercise on small group process. The fourth element of the portfolio is extracts your chosen extracts from your journal, which I'll come to later. And the fifth element is what Durham calls a summative reflection. So did some of you do foundation submission ministry last year, which was yeah. based upon a portfolio, and you were you, you built up as you went along, basically you were told what bits to put in, weren't you? And at the end you asked to write a summative reflection. And the summative reflection is your opportunity, and rather oddly in a Durham portfolio, it comes first, doesn't it, in the portfolio? Even though you write it last, it comes first, because that's their system. And the summative, the summative reflection is your opportunity to say how you think this portfolio for you has met the learning outcomes of the module. And if you remember, for those of you who've done foundations, if you don't, don't worry, it doesn't matter, this is by way of illustration. If you remember, if individual parts of a portfolio at all states are handed in, you only get what is called an indicative mark. Durham never knows what that mark was because the only mark Durham ever gets is your portfolio mark, okay? So what we, so what we do in this module is we, we require you to write a book review. The two exercises, which I'll come to in a minute, I've got some more paper for you. The two exercises are actually what happens at summer school and it's actually what you're graded on at summer school. The journal, and again, I'll come back to that in a minute. The journal starts when you go home tonight. And the summative reflection and the journaling you are given space for at summer school because, which is why we're for your time table, because you'll Tuesday notice. Tuesday afternoon. Sorry? Tuesday afternoon. Yeah, because you'll notice that you've got uh, journal, journal writing time on Tuesday afternoon, and you've got journal writing time on Wednesday afternoon, and you've got summative reflection time on Thursday morning. So, because some years ago, you know, I, as a module leader, said this is the way we're going to do this. We're going to do this by portfolio. The, my big carrot, which some of you know about, I think, and which I'm still unashamedly proud of, is that by the time you leave summer school, you have finished this module. All the work is done. And the slight, slightly smaller carrot, but just as exciting for the tutors, is by the time we leave summer school, we've done all the marking as well. Some of you are in your second or three years, you'll remember that when you came home from summer school last year, you may well have thrown all your books into a bag and put them in a cupboard and not opened them until the 1st of September, because why shouldn't you do that? But you then knew you had an assignment due in October, based upon the work you did at summer school. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, indeed. So the carrot in this module is that that doesn't happen. That means, therefore, if you're going to still write journal entries while you're at summer school, and if I'm going to require you to write a summative reflection at summer school, we have to timetable in what, what Durham calls contact hours for you to be able to do that work while you're at summer school, not using your free time. So it's me. And the summative reflection for this portfolio is only about 750 words. It's 
lot of long piece of work. And obviously you can start putting the odd phrase together as you're going along, because that's what your journal's about. But basically the summative of effect is only about 750 words long, because portfolios don't have a word count. If you write longer, that's absolutely fine by you. And you may find it's difficult to appreciate, but writing a lot more words won't actually help you. Because you've either nailed it or you've not nailed it. And the evidence for the fact that you've what I call nailed it is the extracts that are in your portfolio. And you say, I know now why it's important that people sit in a particular shape in a room. And you say, in, the, in parentheses, you put um, P4. So this is extract four from your, sorry, not P, J4. So this is extract four from your journal which relates in a paragraph your reflection on what happened when you went in one TR today and somebody put all the chairs in the corner and everybody went underneath the table. Yeah. And you use that as your evidence for what you've, for what you've learned in inverted commas about the importance of group, the importance of group analysis. Too. So you use your summative reflection by drawing material from your portfolio, and the, sorry, from the journal. And the journal starts when you go home tonight. Now I know some of you won't do it, but if you think about it, you've got two months to contribute to your journal, because hopefully at some point after tonight, you'll start reading Personal Word and Presence, because you know you've got to do the book review. And it'll help you write the book review as well, won't it? That every time you've read a chapter or half a chapter, or every time you've got to put the book down because you've got to do something else, before you do anything else, you write something in your journal. Oh, really, I like page 42. I have no idea what page 56 means. And you just you write it in there. That will not only help you with your book review, it's then beginning to get you into the habit of thinking about, I'm writing a journal about pastoral care. So when you read something in Kelly, you'll say, that's just like what happened to my auntie, or that's just like what happened in our parish, or that's just the opposite of what happened to my so-and-so. And you begin to make those kind of comments in your, in your journal. And then, the final step is, and again you go back to the, the module on, on Moodle and you look at the reading list, you then begin to make connections to what I call connections to the wider literature. This happens all the time, doesn't it? You write an assignment, you write a, um, a book review, you write a journal reflection, whatever it might be. Because it's a, in a module about a certain subject, you've also tried to make connections with other books that you are not required to read, but make, demonstrate your understanding of the wider field of passion care. How many extracts do you put in on your journal or portfolio? That's a bit being funny with this, it's a bit like a piece of string, but probably half a dozen. And by that I don't, just, don't just raise the question again, because in your portfolio is it? Yeah, she's going through her yeah. portfolio, I'm just wondering how many extracts from your journal do you need? I might, put, I might put six or ten in, and I might, I might reference six of them in the summative reflection. But the crucial thing about a journal is, there's two sides to a journal, isn't it? The crucial thing is it's completely private. So you never hand your journal in. Therefore, that means you decide which extracts you want to put in which form in your portfolio. And therefore, of course, in your in your portfolio, you, in your journal at home, you might keep it handwritten. It's probably not a bad idea to transcribe the bits you want to put in to a word doc that's put into your portfolio. So if you really, if you thought it was important because you've drawn something or the way you've written it in anger or frustration you might scan that and put it in your portfolio. But the crucial thing is, you don't reveal anything from your journal that you don't want to reveal. Otherwise, the journal is of no value to you because you're not going to be honest in the journal. Yeah. Just relating to that. Yes, go Last year, we asked the question whether those journal entries should be dated. Yes. So we write the journal entry and the date that that was entered into our journal. Yeah. And we had a mixture of responses to that. Which uh, response to Yes, you do date them or no, you don't. In, our, in this portfolio, I'm, I'm quite clear, you, you, you date them and then you find a simple way of being able to reference. I mean, if I've got, if I've got you know, six or eight entries, I'm either saying, you know, J123456 or just because you can then put those in parentheses, can't you, for, for the citation. Well, I'm going to put, look in my journal on page 14, paragraph. It could be letters, it could be Roman numerals, whatever. So, the, or, so you don't waste time in writing a summative reflection to make the link to your, to make the link to your journal. So just to clarify, 
Gemma to say on the list. So if you listed six no, yeah. uh, Gemma entries, you'd have them dated, yeah. but with a one, two, three, four. Exactly. Gemma. And, in, and, in, and in your, you in your summative dates. reflection, you just put the, just put the letter. That's right. Unless the date's significant for you. Of course, yeah. Because it's four weeks after the previous entry, or whatever it might be. Or it's day something happened in our country. I mean, you know what I mean? That's kind of. You were, you were, a, you were a couple of seconds late, but so I was joking about it. It, it didn't think one noodle this afternoon. <laughs> so it's there now. It's there yeah, now. but all this, all this, all our whole portfolio, we have to upload it into Cambridge. That's 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 a, that's. I'm not. It might sound like I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm not quite sure about the answer to that question yet because we're using different technology from last year. We're using a different Moodle site, and uh, it is. I have to work out. I'm going to go and talk to Ian, uh, the technical person who does it now. I'm going to work out how to do this. Well, all I can tell you is what we did last year. Last year, you did your book review and you uploaded it to Moodle. I then gave you a Word document which had all the mapping at the beginning that Durham requires and had a, a list of the contents. And in that Word document, you put your journal entries and you wrote your summative reflection and you emailed it to one of the tutors. Right? And then we, and I'll show you this piece of paper in a minute, we then pasted in to your portfolio the two great, the two results of the two exercises, and we uploaded your portfolio and gave it a grade. And we just, we, I just got to work out with Ian how we do that because we're using slightly different technology this year. And whatever we do, it has to be doable at summer school with a moderately good internet connection. You know what I mean? Liverpool home tends to be a bit in a lot of people on the campus. <coughs> It does mean, let me say this now in case I forget, it does mean that you all do need access to you know, either a laptop or an iPad or some device where you can write things into a, a, a Word document and then either e and probably email it and possibly upload it while you're at summer school. Uh, there are uh, uh, PCs that you can use in the, in the university library, but sadly, when we're at Liverpool Hope, the university library isn't open very much and they go into kind of summer hours. So if you suddenly find you want to do something, you'll just find it closed. So you do need some device to be able to write in. Now, nine <coughs> times out of ten, that isn't a problem. But if you if you think that's going to be a problem for you, then please speak to me outside this meeting, and we'll just make sure we we'll just make sure you've got something. You know, I'll save ourselves a couple of laptops, for example, if necessary. But most people nowadays tend to have something that they can do that work on. And if you need any any technical help. Well, that sort of school would make sure you get that as well. Any more questions? I'm going to hand. Could you? Um, could you send those to your right, Vanessa? meet them in the middle so we don't get mixed up because <laughs> they look the same apart from two words but the, the top looks the same Before we, when we first started doing this course five or six years ago, we had a, we had a similar kind of pattern, but we had work doing Durham portfolios. Even in those days, I asked people to write a book review. And part of my agenda for getting to write the book review is to make sure you've read the book. That's, that's the education reason for writing a book review. Read the book. When did the book review due in? that the same? 10th of July. 10th of July. Wednesday, the 10th of July. Have we crossed in the middle? Yeah. Good, 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 good.
1,500. Should have a group process one and a theological reflection one. They look very similar, but they are different. That makes sense? Yeah. So you should, you should have one that says pastoral care, and you should say have one that says, sorry, you should have one that says group process skills and one that says theological reflection skills. Does that make sense? Okay. So I'm looking at the, I'm looking at the theological reflection skills, okay? In, in very, very round terms, but not in like a mathematical connection, Durham portfolios for a 20 credit module are usually a 7,500 word equivalent. An equivalent means that you don't count the words, it just means it's about that size. Uh, for those of you doing 20 credit modules at Durham, you've picked up by now that the word count is usually 6,000 words, isn't it? You know, a couple of, couple of 3,000 words. Now, a couple of two, five thousand words, a couple of two and a half thousand word essays, isn't it? Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the for, for Durham portfolios, it's, it's about seven and a half thousand words ish. But we don't. But nobody counts the words. I mean, th there is no word count. It's just it's just it's just to give you a clue of, of the amount of work that's going in. So very very approximately in my mind, there's something like about fifteen hundred words worth of marks going on the on the um, book review and about uh, near about two and a half thousand to three thousand words of value going on your ability to do theological reflection and about two and a half thousand to three thousand worth words of value on you being able to understand group process and about 750 words ish on you be able to write up your summative reflection and already that just tips over seven and a half thousand what i'm trying to say is we're trying to give significant weight to the two practical tasks that you do at Summer School. Yeah. The book review is important. The summative reflection is, is a real opportunity by the time you get to the end of the week to really demonstrate that you understand what you're doing now. And if ever there is a module where we want to grade you on what you were like at the end rather than the beginning, this is that module. You know what I mean? So if you if you demonstrate, you know good insights about yourself and about pastoral care and other people and group process and you can articulate that in some way by the end, by the end of the week and that, that is how you're going to get a good grade in this portfolio. I do think, and, I, and I, this has been the case in the past, that sometimes people who amongst you, even, 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 even between yourselves, you've acknowledged as being the really kind of um, clever ones who seem to be able to write very well and are good with words, don't always do brilliantly well in this module. And some of the people who really struggle sometimes because they just have difficulty getting the words down on the paper, when it comes to practical skills and sketch, they just shine. And then every combination in between. And some people are just, you know, good at everything. So it, 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 is, it is an opportunity to be assessed in a different kind of way. So what we do is, I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna stop at eight o'clock for a break, by the way. What we do is we put, we put you into, um, groups hopefully with about seven or eight people in and you have opportunities to lead a theological reflection in each of those sessions. Now this is the bit that's difficult to get your head around. You're going to say, 
Well, Gary, is that the run play advantage going first or the run play advantage going towards the end? And the bottom line is, there's a cost and promise of going first, and there's a cost and promise of going last, and it kind of evens itself out. Because when, when the tutor is trying to fill in this form for you on, say, theological reflection skills, and it says, for example, things like, um, number, block number two, applying knowledge and understanding, demonstrating awareness of the concept of theological reflection, or you can demonstrate an awareness of the concept of theological reflection in a group, either when you're the mentor, the facilitator, or the presenter, or a member of the group. Yeah? You don't have to be the person who, in inverted commas, stood at the front, or sat on the end of the ring, who's actually doing the facilitation. And if I go to the, um, well, if I go to the group process one, for example, mm -hmm. Um, I'm, on, I'm, on the, I'm on the first box, delivering practical skills, and it says offer facilitation to the group. Yeah? You don't have to be the facilitator to do that. <laughs> you just get more opportunity to do that when you're the facilitator. So you're saying we're all being assessed on all these different criteria all the time. Exactly. Exactly. It doesn't matter what we're doing. Exactly. It's like basketball. Second like, yeah. <laughs> 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 we did quite well to get to five to eight, not mention that. So <laughs> and it's a, another example would be leadership, wouldn't it? It's very obvious when somebody leads, because they're in the role of being the leader in those moments. But you don't have to be the leader to lead. What you say can change the course of a conversation or the direction of the direction of the group. And one of the Let's, 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 let's think about going near the end. Near, near, near the end, you think, no, it's easy near the end, because by the near the end, we'll have had more experience. By near the end, we expect everyone in the group to be better. Do you know what I mean? Because your ability to lead to God's reflection depends not just on your ability, but on the ability of the group. Yeah? And that's the fact, we all, with the staff involved, I'll come, come back to that in a second, we all, in those groups, from Saturday to Wednesday, get better at doing a theological reflection between, between the eight or nine of us. Okay? And the, the tutors, the staff, whatever we call ourselves, although we are tasked with doing this assessment, whereby by the end of the week, each tutor, pairs in each group, will talk to each other, uh, or if there happens to be a tutor around, they'll talk to themselves and go to somebody else will be in the group at some point. They will fill in one of, will fill in a group process sheet and a theological reflection sheet for every single person, single person in the group. So although, although we are tasked with assessment, for every single theological reflection that we do, the tutors participate. Yeah? So the tutors are participants. They are not neutral, mute observers. So we, to use, to use an image, because you know I like images, uh, if we're assessing your swimming skills, then all the tutors are in the swimming pool. They don't, they don't walk around the outside with a clipboard saying that backstroke's not very good. <laughs> not very good at all, actually. Why don't you get in and show me how to do a backstroke? Oh, I couldn't possibly do that. I couldn't possibly do that. So all the tutors are in the group. So the tutors will, the tutors will shine, have good days and have bad days. They'll make mistakes, just like you, because they're all human beings. And they're not the experts. They're just, they're just people who've done this before. They're not the experts, they're just people of experience. And between us, I'm always in, I'm just always impressed, but I know it's going to happen. Between us, we get a really accurate snapshot, I think, of where people have got to by the end of the week. And therefore, also remember, if it's a portfolio, you don't have, if, obviously, if, if everything's stunning, you're going to get a stunning portfolio, great. But because it's a portfolio, if there's a weak bit, then the person giving the overall portfolio grade may well overlook that or weigh it down because basically the portfolio is really good. Yeah, it's not about a mathematical connection between all the different elements of the portfolio. So it gives, it gives you a lot of freedom, basically. So it's eight o'clock. Should we have a five, five minute break there? We can stretch your legs or eat Angie's chocolates or whatever. We'll come back and do another half an hour or so. We'll have a little bit of worship and then we'll go home. Is that okay?